Welcome back. So for this lecture video, we will now be focusing about um, regional anesthesia and local anesthesia. All right, let's begin. Local or regional anesthesia enables us to do surgeries on standing animals, uh, which eliminates the, num uh, the numerous risks sorry, of general anesthesia, not just to the animal, but also to us as the personnel. Right? So the only drug that I will be discussing right here would be the most commonly used uh, local anesthesia, which is lidocaine, right? This is most used. Um, the onset is quite fast. Again, this is dependent on how big the size of the area that you need to infiltrate it with. Usually the onset is two to five minutes. And what's good with lidocaine it is it has analgesic effects. So the analgesic duration would be 90 to 180 minutes. Um, the anesthetic uh, effect would be 60 minutes, right? And the preparation for lidocaine is usually just 2%, which means it is 20 milligrams per ml, right? Now, um, every animal which has, um, you know, um, will be undergoing anesthesia for lidocaine, they have what we call a maximum allowable dose, right? Remember, you are not giving this like other drugs were in. You have to stick with a 2 mg per keg or a 0 0.01 mg per keg, and that's it, right? You use lidocaine to physically spread it around an area or to inject it on a nerve which controls a certain area, right? And the maximum allowable dose for small ruminants is 5 mg per keg. For cattle, it's 10 mg per keg, right? I will only be focusing um, more, I will be focusing more in cattle and small ruminants as compared to horses because horses um, are commonly induced with general anesthesia. Now, small ruminants are actually, in some literature, the maximum allowable dose is 10 mg per kilo as well, but they are more sensitive, uh, sensitive especially the goats, to develop lidocaine toxicity. So um, it is believed that you should just stick with a dose of five mg per keg, right? Again, um, these numbers change depending on what literature you are using. So I am just presenting to you what I saw ng mas madalas in more um, recent uh, literature, right? And another preparation for lidocaine is um, it co-administered with epinephrine, usually at a, at, a, at a dose or a preparation of 1 is to 100,000 units, right? So uh, as you can see here in this picture. And this is used to prolong the anesthetic effects uh, from just uh, one hour to two hours, right? Now, there is this uh, disadvantage of giving lidocaine with epinephrine, okay? What is the most common or uh, effect, sorry, most um, common cardiovascular effect of epinephrine? Aside from the fact that it is an enotropic, chronotropic drug, it causes vasoconstriction. So when it is locally administered into a certain area wherein you are going to do the surgery the vessels would be vasoconstricted um it's a double-edged sword we're in lidocaine causes vasodilation so you have a lot of bleeding which that is addressed by giving lidocaine with epinephrine so hindi masyadong madugo yung surgery however when we talk about the wound healing system and the processes of that the epinephrine could cause a delay in healing because there is uh, the vessel surrounding that area which needs to heal are constricted. So it's just a matter of how, um, how you balance these two effects, right? So I'll give you uh, one example of a problem right now, <laughs> right? For example, right? This is a common question of how you know how much lidocaine you can inject into a patient, right? So 
Question, what is the maximum volume of 2% lidocaine that could be given to a 50 kilo goat for a local block? How do we find the answer to that? Mm -hmm. You have a maximum allowable dose right there, which is 5 milligram per kilo. You have the body weight of the goat, 50 kilos, so you multiply that. 50 times 5. Should I play the Jeopardy song again? Let me, let me, let me play the Jeopardy song. 50 kilos times 5 milligram per keg um, will give you what? What value and in what unit of measurement? Okay, that's Shadano uh, Mahaba for only a 50 times 5, right? 250 mig, right? 250 mig. Now, how, um, when I say max volume, I'm not looking for the milligrams, I'm looking for the ml. So, you divide the 250 milligrams that you calculated with the preparation. Sorry, I wasn't able to make a PowerPoint of this. I think it was, I think this is a quite straightforward thing, so it didn't bother. Wait, where's my calculator? Ayan ha, sasama ko na kayong mag-calculate. Because <laughs> I don't want to be wrong. Oh, yeah. 250 divided by uh, 20. I actually know the answer, but I'm just... Yeah. Alright. 250 divided by 20. That is 12.5 ml, all right? So that is the maximum amount of lidocaine that you can inject into an animal for the entire procedure, all right? Now, it is up to you if you want to divide that. It depends on how you're going to use um, that 12.5, all right? And a 50 kilo goat, that's quite big already, all right? So regional anesthesia, just focus on the part which is uh, highlighted or pointed out. <laughs> with a blue box, this lidocaine, lidocaine with epinephrine as the usual dosages, but I will discuss more later as to what dose to use, all right? So first, since we're talking about regional anesthesia, um, we're going at this um, for this lecture video um, per body part that commonly requires anesthesia, all right? Let's start with the eye. The eye can be anesthetized topically, which means you can uh, instill one to two drops of uh, preparacaine to desensitize the cornea, right? The onset is fast, 30 seconds. The duration is uh, 10 to 15 minutes, right? The indications, why would you need to anesthetize the eye itself, right? Uh, for example, you need to conduct an ocular examination and you don't want the animal to, to fuzz about it. Number two, if you need to stain the cornea to check for ulcers, this is very co uh, much commonly done in horses than in, than in ruminants. You need to remove uh, minor foreign bodies. You need to clean the eye. Um, preparacaine also helps relieve blepharospasms, which are associated with an, an underlying corneal disease or superficial irritation. Now, the eyelid or the palpebrae, of course, are very much, uh, very uh, serves as a very good mechanical barrier against all of this irritation but since the size of the horse the size of the horse's eye are quite big they are still quite susceptible for these things um, usually this is a supplemental procedure following a nerve block around the eye to facilitate um, um, eye manipulation in some aspects all right so let's go now to the oropalpebral nerve block, right? So as a review of pharma, when we say nerve block, you are injecting the local anesthesia, lo local anesthetic to the nerve itself, 
right? That is different from a field block, a line block, or a neural block, right? This is what we call a perineural anesthesia. You're surrounding or you're injecting uh, the anesthetic directly into the nerve, right? So for this case, we are going to talk about the auriculopalpebral nerve block. Um, that nerve is quite thick. It is very much palpable at dorsocaudal aspect of the zygomatic arch. Um, it crosses the... We're going to talk about a lot of anatomy terms here, all right? So the auriculopalpebral nerve crosses the medial aspect, okay? Medial aspect of the zygomatic arch near the base of the ear, all right? And then tuloy-tuloy siya paharap papunta sa dorsomedial aspect of the ear, all right? And by its name, what does it supply, this nerve? Auriculopalpebral nerve is a branch of the facial nerve. Okay, um, it supplies the orbicularis oculi muscle. So when you do an auriculopalpebral nerve block, you are preventing the eyelids from moving. Right? That entails that you need to take care of the cornea while it, it cannot be protected by the eyelids. Right? So how do you do this? Once you have located it, you instill 3 to 5 ml of 2% lidocaine uh, subcutaneously in that area in a fan-like manner. You see where his index finger is, right? And effect is eyelid akinesis. Okay. So I'll show you a video for this because that is the best way to <laughs> teach uh, these uh, nerve blocks. Right. Oh, hold on. Okay. Now I've shown you a lot of videos in horses. Um, intravenous, uh, catheterization, and such. Why is it always on the left? You will see, of course, um, there's, there are a lot of times wherein you also do intravenous catheterization on the right jugular vein, but why is it that most of these procedures are, carry, are um, done on the left side? Hmm? All right, I'll leave that question for you to answer. Right? Of course, um, if, the, if the eye to be examined is on the right side, you do, you do the nerve block on the right side. But those uh, minor procedures, IV catheterization, when you stand, when you do your physical examination, it's always on the left side. Why? Right? Now, let's uh, watch how the, this nerve block is done. I don't know if there's music to it. There is. <laughs> Bait that area with the needle. That nerve is quite big, so you could actually feel for it. Then you massage. Okay, to make sure that that uh, area is well infiltrated by the local anesthetic. Right, next, for the eye again, the retrobulbar block, okay? This uh, block can be done in, um, what do you call this? In, two, uh, in three ways, actually in three ways. The most common would be the four-point block, uh, wherein it desensitizes all ocular muscles and the optic nerve, which means it can desensitize CN2, 3, 6, and parts of the facial nerve. This is indicated for inoculation and eyelid surgery. So how do you do this? Um, four point, meaning you are going to place those needles in four parts or four aspects of the, um, of the eye. Usually it's 12, three, nine, and either five or seven o'clock. Um, it uh, not, never six because six would put you right across the optic nerve and you don't want to hit that ng sakto. Because again, the optic nerves are connected for the left and the right. You don't want to operate on the left, desensitize the left, and then you compromise the vision on the right. All right? Disadvantages, since you are, um, this is technical, 
um, incorrect administration into the meninges is common uh, complication. It could cause retrobulbar hemorrhage when you puncture those vessels behind the the eyeball, and of course, damage to the globe and optic nerve if not done properly. All right. So twelve. Uh, sorry. The directions would be medial and lateral cantus for three and nine o'clock, dorsal and ventral orbital rims for twelve o'clock, and either five or seven o'clock. Right? And the thing is, when you are inserting these needles, the nature of the the nature of the eyeball is to veer away from the needle. So it would uh, displace itself cranially. Parashanagpaproptose to give uh, space for the needle at the back. Right? It's just how it is. It's like when you puncture the ab abdomen, the 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 <laughs> the intestines would actually gravitate uh, towards the dorsal wall of the body. Dahil iiwas siya uh, dun sa needle during abdominosynthesis. So same same concept. Right? So how is it done? Let me show you a video once again because they are the perfect teachers. For this. Let's play this first. Um, the needles that you need. Sorry, I, I kind of skipped that, right? Um, the needle that you need for this, again, are spinal needles which are around three to four inches in length and the gauges you know how 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 big it is the diameter depends on the block that you're doing which we will be discussing in a bit um as per block that we are discussing i'll be telling you the gauge that is used so for this let's watch her um do a uh, prepare for this block um you can either do this through the eyelid or you can lift the eyelid up itself and go underneath the eyelid. In a dead cow, it's hard to demonstrate what the, the eye position might be, but it generally it's simpler actually to go through the eyelid. So you use your index finger to, to press the globe and then pass your needle. Um, um, you can either do this through the eyelid or you can lift the eyelid up itself and go underneath the eyelid. Oh. Uh, the first step is to get yourself a long needle, so this is a spinal needle and remove the stylet from the needle because you don't need that to do the block and then you want to put a curve in your needle. Um, so I'm just going to use my fingers to do that and you essentially want a curve that will, will allow your needle to pass to the back of the, the eye. So if you imagine um, this is the front of your eyeball and this is the optic nerve, um, this is the globe, um, your needle, you want it to go in and go round the back of the globe um, and anaesthetise the back of the eye and as you come out you're going to deposit anaesthetic all the way round to the front of the eye. In a dead cow it's hard to demonstrate what the, the eye is. So you use your index finger to depress the globe and then pass your needle um, through the eyelid, making sure you don't perforate the eye obviously, and round the back of the eyeball and your needle should pretty much disappear, just as this has, and um, that's you round, round the back. And you're going to attach your syringe and deposit your anaesthetic. Oops. In a sort of fan action as you withdraw your needle. So that's about 12 mils in, in that site. Then you're going to repeat again ventrally. So again, I would probably go through the eyelid. So if you press the globe in with your finger, go underneath your finger and behind the globe. And then attach your syringe. And we're going to fan and inject as we withdraw. and then you're going to do your medial and lateral so they can be a wee bit more difficult because there's not as much soft tissue or conjunctiva in these positions so generally for the medial you can't really go through the eyelid because you're right onto bone but if you come as close to the eyelid as you can into the conjunctiva almost the conjunctiva of the third eyelid and pass your needle round the back of the eye here we are I'm going to inject again here. And I'm just going to 
skip round here for the lateral. Again, you can probably get behind, or sorry, through the eyelid here, but if you push the eye out of the way, it will make it a little bit easier. Pass your needle right round the back. Attach your syringe. And just fan that around as you pull out. might be but it generally it's simpler actually to go through the eyelid um, so you use your index finger to depress the globe and oh, then pass sorry. your needle um, all right I should have started with this should have started with this <laughs> all right uh, the first step is to get yourself a long needle so this is a spinal needle and remove the stylet from the needle because you don't need that to do the block and then you want to put a curve in your needle um, so I'm just going to use my fingers to do that and you essentially want a curve that will, will allow your needle to pass to the back of the, the eye so if you imagine um, this is the front of your eyeball and this is the optic the next uh, block would be the ocular conus block this only entails injection uh, once um, with a needle to the retrobulbar space. So basically you are, uh, I call this, just, you're doing just the dorsal approach and you are going to inject 10 ml of lidocaine. Again, that is relative. Insert it to the most caudal aspect of the supraorbital fossa. Uh, again, anatomy, that's the part of the orbit, dorsal part that guards the eye. You feel for that bone, you will feel a depression just uh, a little bit ventral to it, and that's where you um, insert the needle. All right, this is a video of that. All right, sorry, I can't find an, uh, a better video for this. This is a enucleation of a horse. All right. Because usually your hands are occluding the 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 position. So that part of the eye, the horse has already been sedated. Again, you don't need to do general anesthesia for horses all the time, especially if it's just a, a eye surgery. You could just give it heavy sedation, support it with ropes everywhere, right? So that is it. Uh, this is uh, more commonly done in horses than in cattle. Then there's a nerve, uh, this is the globe. Um, your needle, you want it to go in and go round the back of the globe um, and anesthetize the back of the eye. And as you come out, you're going to deposit anesthetic all the way round to the front of the eye. All right, now let's watch this. So you use your index finger to depress the globe and then pass your needle um, through the eyelid, making sure you don't perforate the eye, obviously, and round the back of the eyeball. And your needle should pretty much disappear, just as this has. And other um, block, uh, which is the Peterson block, this is, uh, co provides complete motor and sensory block of the eye. Um, the cranial nerves that are desensitized are these three, four, six, and three branches of the trigeminal nerve, namely ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular. And the injection side are between. <laughs> okay. Um, well, basically, that's the that's the anatomical landmark for it. So it's cranial to the mandibular ramus behind the. Mm, is this the frontal? No, temporal process. Frontal process of the zygomatic bone. Zygomatic process of temporal bone. Right. Yeah. So there's a depression behind that bone. And you insert the needle quite deep, 7 to 10 centimeters, towards the foramen inside, which is the foramen orbitarotarotundum. Right? Say that 10 times. Orbitarotundum. Right? And this one, since it's quite deep, you need to use around 15 ml. Okay? Um, it, it, it may be... Uh, more technically challenging to perform, but it has lower risk of hemorrhage than the four-point block. It, uh, it could also cause penetration of the globe. Uh, sorry, um, it could have a lower risk of penetrating the globe, 
damaging the optic nerve or injection into the meninges as compared to the four-point block. All right, this is how it's done. Again, cattle sedated. You feel for that bone of the, uh, the zygomatic process of temporal bone. Feel depression, you insert it there, 90 degrees. Deep, all right. So again, it's not about what you see, it's about what you feel in surgery. Oof. I've, I think I've heard that a lot. Okay, and the thing is, um, for some anesthetists, as they withdraw, they will continue to infuse it with anesthesia as they withdraw the needle. That's also uh, one tactic that they use. All right. Next. Um, that's you round, round the back. And you're going to attach your syringe and deposit your anesthetic. Oops. In a sort of fan action as you withdraw your needle. So that's about 12 mils in, in that site. Then you're going to repeat again ventrally. So again, I would probably go through the eyelid. So if you press the globe in with your finger, go underneath your finger and behind the globe. And then attach your syringe. And we're going to fan and inject as we withdraw. And then you're going to do your medial and lateral. So they can be a wee bit more difficult because there's not as much. Dehorning or disbotting, okay? Classic corneal nerve block. And what's, uh, what makes this hard for some is that um, as they grow, okay, as they, uh, that's why you disbot as early as, you know, um, as early as you can, because when, when they grow up and that horn continues to grow, the amount of innervation or amount of nerves surrounding it also increases. So it's it's way better to disbud them or dehorn them as young as they are. Right? The corneal nerve, as it is, just the corneal nerve, is palpable between the lateral canthus of the eyes and the horn base. Right? As you can see in the picture of the cow on the right side, it's just right there. Um, it's quite palpable too in adult animals, right? In small ruminants, the corneal nerve, however, in addition to that, there are branches of the infratrochlear nerve, which extends to the horn base, right? Um, there's a lot of uh, nerves to target when you do this. So you can either do the nerve block, just target the corneal nerve, or you have to do a circumferential block meaning you inject the lidocaine around the horn to infiltrate any nerves that could have been innervating that horn All right um since goats are very sensitive to lidocaine and for developing lidocaine toxicity you do this more uh, you divide um, the lidocaine the maximum dose of lidocaine throughout the horn to make sure that every drop of that lidocaine is used Okay, example of this. Sorry for this image. Is this something producers can do? Yes, producers can do this. They have to, uh, it is, a, uh, lidocaine is a prescription product, so they will have to get with their veterinarian to do it. As you can see, it's right there on that line between the corner of the eye to where the horn would be. It's only going in about a it anywhere from 3 to 10 cc's depending on the size of the animal. About how long does it take for this to work or go into Typically effect? two to three minutes you'll see most of them work. Sometimes if you don't get it right on the nerve it may take a little longer. Okay. You feel for that corneal nerve? Producers can do? Yes. Producers can. On the lateral canthus of the eye and the horn base it's in the middle. Look at the look at the calf looking at the needle. And be prepared for them to get hurt. 
Remember, you're targeting a nerve. So if you hit that nerve, of course, it's going to be painful. It means you're actually on the right spot. Oh, sorry. That's why I don't like working with farm animals, man. I tend to pity them. Okay, you inject. Oh, and of course, whenever you do these blocks, make sure that that area has been, you know, prepped. Ideally, it has been shaved and prepped like you would a surgical site because you are making a puncture wound. And um, that needle will reach a nerve, which might be, um, no, which is... Uh, quite resistant to any inflammatory cells from getting there to to contact any bacteria or virus that you inject all right so make sure that when you do these blocks clean the area properly okay for uh for uh, not kids <laughs> adult goats right <laughs> you can mark the areas first wherein you plan to do the blocks right you feel that depression again okay because remember the skull uh, has a lot of uh, holes in it so you have to take advantage of those uh, holes to reach the nerves inside Fast forward this one. Okay, clean it. Very good, sir. <laughs> and be careful when you do this because it's the eye that's near it. Usually for small goals, you usually use a 20 gauge to 22 gauge because you're just penetrating a very thin subcutaneous tissue. All right. Well, for some, they use 18 gauge apparently. <laughs> A bleb that will um, develop is normal. Okay, then you massage that area to make sure even the smallest nerves around it are infiltrated with the local anesthesia. And you feel for it. Oop. The nerves are quite big and wide, and there's no. A muscle between the skin and the nerve so you could actually palpate this all right wait for three to five minutes and you're good all right now before they can... how do you know that your local anesthetic is working there's a lot of ways to know with um when we do abdominal surgeries, but for these areas, how do we know that the local anesthetic 
has been there. For example, we wait for five minutes. How do we know that it's already good? Except for the fact that we waited five minutes already. You can actually do this. Oh, not that, not massage. You can prick it. You can, uh, oh, it doesn't show. Sorry, it doesn't show. Um, you, can, you can get a needle and try to prick those areas and check for any recognition of pain from the animal. Okay, that would do it. But when we talk about flank blocks, which we're going to be talking about right now, uh, the next slide, there's a lot more ways to check for the efficacy of your local anesthetic. All right. Soft tissue or conjunctiva in these positions. So generally for the medial, you can't really go through the eyelid because you're right onto bone. But if you come as close to the eyelid as you can into the conjunctiva, almost the conjunctiva of the third. Okay. So for anesthesia for abdominal surgeries, you have a lot of options. It all depends. It all depends on what you want to do, okay? On what will be most beneficial to your animal, what is needed in terms of the surgical procedure that you're doing, how the level of manipulation that you are going to induce to the patient, that uh, those are the factors that you need to consider when you decide on what level of anesthesia you have to induce to these uh, large ruminants, right? So for infiltration anesthesia, the lidocaine is injected on or around the surgical site. So you have a planned area for your surgical incision. That is the place wherein you inject the lido, right? Now, uh, as compared to the other ones wherein we target nerves, for infiltration anesthesia, we target nerve endings. So these are the nerve endings supplying that area um, as a sensory neuron, and you target them to be numb to any uh, stimuli that you induce, right? Advantages is that you don't need any technical skills required because you are not identifying specific nerves. You only need to identify your planned um, site of attack, and that's what you uh, infiltrate with lidocaine. This is applicable for if you need to remove uh, superficial tumors or masses, uh, for minor wound management wherein uh, it's superficial, you just need to uh, to clean and explore a superficial wound which is not penetrating that much muscular tissue, muscular tissue, right? The disadvantage though, disadvantage would be you need to use large volumes of anesthetic, right? Um, it all depends on how big your surgery, uh, uh, sorry, how big your planned incision is, right? So with large volumes of anesthesia, the risk for lidocaine toxicity also increases. Um, with lidocaine, there, of course, I discussed this, there is, a, there is a local vasodilation, so there is increased surgical bleeding. If you um, instead use lidocaine with epinephrine, that addresses the vasodilation, but now you have a problem with delayed healing. Um, the subcutaneous tissue, muscles, and fascia need to be penetrated by the anesthetic if you expect to manipulate these um, tissues as well. And if you need to suddenly extend your incision, you cannot do that until you um, provide additional local anesthetic infiltration to the area where you, in you need to uh, um, incise again, right? So... A lot of advantages, disadvantages still being used for those certain indications. Examples of these are line block, ring block, and field block. Basically, you're infiltrating that area. So let's start with the most commonly used, uh, the field block, right? The inverted L block, okay? In this um, specific kind of um, infiltration anesthesia, you are targeting the nerves, on the region where the surgery will be done, all right? So uh, you have to watch for these anatomical landmarks, the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae as, as the site for your horizontal infiltration. And for the vertical infiltration of anesthesia, you have to look for the caudal border of the last rib, right? So this addresses the delayed healing disadvantage um, which is usually done with the line block, 
Kasi yung nilalagay mong lidocaine and epi are not in the exact incision site, but they are in the places where the nerve uh, where the nerve endings are, which controls the area where your incision will be. Okay, so anatomic markers, indications, flank clap, or paramedian incisions. All right, this could also be done mirror wise, like mirror image, if you need um, to uh, block more space. Right? The method here is you need to do multiple injections of various depths, okay? Because if you are doing a flank laparotomy, you need to make sure that you also block the peritoneum. So your needle should reach the peritoneum as well, right? And the same, uh, the same concept na uh, fan shape, as you, uh, when you inject, you inject it, you sway the needle from left to right, like, dorsal to ventral, caudal to cranial, um, and as you withdraw the needle, you infiltrate it more, right? So let's watch a video of how it's done, because that's the best thing. So we're getting ready to do the block in this cow. She's actually started on the top shelf of that. The tail jack helps cows do not like needles. She's infiltrating and moving. If you hit a vessel while moving, you usually put minimal lidocaine in the vessel and that makes it pretty safe and you don't have to constantly draw back. Now she's shifted to the vertical portion of the inverted L. Looks like her needle's getting a bit dull here, making it even harder to get through cowhide. Again, you need to... So we're getting ready to do the block in this cow. She's actually started on the top shelf of that. The tail jack helps cows do not like needles. She's infiltrating and moving. If you hit a vessel while moving, you usually put minimal lidocaine in the vessel and that makes it pretty safe and you don't have to constantly draw back. Now she shifted to go fairly deep to get to the peritoneum. It is hard to block the peritoneum totally and cutting that can be painful. She's infiltrating in several different directions, probably more than necessary. I usually just go horizontally toward the tail for the top block and then up and down for this part of the block. But it never hurts to put a little extra lidocaine in there. Again, as she's injecting, She'll move back and forth to minimize any just straight vascular injection of the lidocaine. Another thing she's doing is going through her previous block, and that will also create a little less pain for the cow. So if you go through the part where you've already injected lidocaine, that's usually numbed fairly quickly, and it will help the injection process. To the vertical portion of the inverted L, Looks like her needle's getting a bit dull here, making it even harder to get through cowhide. Again. Okay. What did, you, what did she just say? The needle is getting dull. Yes, because you don't change your needle after, you know, after one injection. You usually just go straight. Until it gets quite dull, then you have to replace it. Farm approach. Okay, this farm approach. You need to go fairly deep to get to the peritoneum. It is hard to block the peritoneum totally and cutting that can be painful. She's infiltrating in several different directions, probably more than necessary. I usually just go horizontally toward the tail for the top block and then up and down for this part of the block. But it never hurts to put a little extra lidocaine in there. Again, as she's injecting, she'll move back and forth to minimize any just straight vascular injection of the lidocaine. Another thing she's doing is going through her previous block, and that will also create a little less pain for the cow. New needle so if you go alert. Through the part where you've already injected lidocaine, that's usually numbed fairly quickly, and, and it will help the injection process. All right. So you have to imagine how deep your needle should go into, um, how deep the sorry, how thick the muscles are. Dahil dapat ganon din kahaba yung needle mo for you to reach the peritoneum. Especially if you're doing a laparotomy, wherein you are going to incise the peritoneum, it's going to be very um, uh, painful for the animal. Now, you, of course, you incise the skin, the muscle, it's okay because it has been infiltrated with anesthesia. But if you do not uh, use a long enough needle to reach the peritoneum, then you're going to have a problem later when you're about to incise that tissue. Right? So again, it presents those uh, disadvantages because you have to um, you have to make multiple um, puncture wounds. You you're not sure if it actually works. That's the paravertebral nerve block is one of the most commonly used blocks in 
um, cattle, okay, in, in, uh, in large ruminant surgery, right? This provides anesthesia for the entire paralumbar region and it blocks certain nerves. It blocks the last thoracic spinal nerve, which is T13, and the first two lumbar spinal nerves, which is L1 and L2, as they emerge from the vertebral canal through the intervertebral foramina, right? And if you remember your anatomy, they do not exit at a, you know, a straight angle. They, are, they curve a little bit cranially. They, they curve a little bit cranially and then they go caudally, all right? So when you feel for the processes, you know, the transverse processes of T13, L1, L2, L3, um, you would have an idea as to where those um, nerves are, right? This is more effective way of uh, desensitizing the peritoneum um, and keeps the abdominal wall relaxed because remember when it's too uh, flexed, right? You will have a hard time later um, manipulating or suturing it in if your abdominal wall is so flexed, right? Advantages, less anesthetic use as compared to the infiltration anesthesia that we saw earlier. Um, again, no lidocaine in the incision site, so your healing would be okay. And more versatility with incision placement. You can extend uh, your incision um, with more uh, space and uh, more confidence. Dahil alam mong blocked yung buong area na yon. Okay? So, anatomy. Um, you have to locate the tubercoxae. That's the, the cranial part of the hip bone. And the first palpable transverse process cranial to it corresponds to L5. Okay, there are two ways to do paravertebral nerve block, is proximal and distal. And thank God for internet, because that led me to Ohio State University's um, video on this uh, nerve block. It is 15 minutes and it's very informative. Watch this. Um, this is unlisted, I think. So um, you will see the card right there. <laughs> Uh, to lead you to this um, uh, video, watch this and uh, focus on these um, questions. All right, what equipment are needed? The functions of the equipment and the significance of the specificity of the things the size. Um, how to find the nerves to desensitize and the important anatomical landmarks. What are what is the main difference between proximal and distal nerve uh, paravertebral nerve block? And how do we know the block is effective, right? Again, I will list all these questions in the classroom. It's up to you if you want to answer them, all right? Your grade, your problem, all right? So let's move on to the next one. So if you need a bigger space for you to do surgery, or if you're going to do surgeries on the anus, perineum, vulva, caudal vagina, and caudal aspects of the thigh, um, caudal epidural anesthesia is the way to go, all right? So you have to allocate two spaces, the sacrococcygeal space, which is between um, the fifth sacral vertebrae and the first uh, caudal vertebrae, or you could go for the first intercoccygeal space, which is between the first and the second caudal vertebrae. Now, what's the difference between the two? Um, in uh horses in sorry in bigger animals which is cattle and horses the sacrococcygeal space would be bigger okay it would with the the gap would be bigger as compared to the first intercoccygeal space for small ruminants you could have an option for both um this is signified by the picture on the right wherein you try to flex or move the tail up and down you will feel a depression and that is the sacrococcygeal space right where the index finger is and what you will need would be dependent on the animal species for cattle you need uh the dose is 1 ml per 100 kilo body weight that will last you 60 to 80 minutes of anesthesia um it is usually um, mixed with silazin for longer duration so that increases it to 180 to 210 minutes um, and the dose for that would be different. That would be lidocaine is 0.22 mg per keg and silazin is 0.03 mg per keg. Can they be mixed in the same syringe? Yes. Um, some veterinarians would not uh, prefer to, but 
yeah, you mix them both and then you instill them into the epidural space. For smaller ruminants and pigs, um, 2% lidocaine, 1 mil per 50 kilogram. Remember, your ruminants are very much sensitive to lidocaine toxicity. So also the volumes of the lidocaine matter as to how fast you're injecting them. Uh, less than 10 mils, you can inject th this less than a minute. Volumes uh, greater than 10 ml, which should be slowly over 5 to 10 minutes to prevent it from um, spreading that fast. Or if it's released, we call this, uh, when, you, when you administer large volumes into the epidural space, that actually causes, uh, what do you call this, mechanical compression of the nerve endings. And that could cause your patient to suddenly become recumbent. Right? They will get over it, but they will become recumbent, which you do not want. Right? So what else? Oh, the onset of action for this is around three to four minutes. Okay? And the same way as you, uh, um, how you know if it works, same way as the flank um, anesthesia. All right. So you can have a 1.5 to 3 inch 18 gauge to 22 gauge needle. So 18 gauge for the bigger animals, 22 gauge for the smaller animals. You insert that into the space at a 45 to 90 degree angle. Why is that so big, right? When I first saw videos of this, they usually do this at a 90 degree angle. But when I saw blogs, <laughs> research for this, ima imagine uh, you're, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to vent for a while. I'm going to vent. This is why it's hard to teach something that you have not uh, taught before because you're doing everything from scratch you're you're it's like if if i ask you to make a report weekly <laughs> of something that you need to research on it's it's just hard because you have to update your your knowledge or something that you actually thought might be wrong now or there's a newer technology it's just so challenging but anyway <laughs> all right why is it 45 to 90 in some literature, it's actually you insert the needle 45 degrees, like as you can see, letter B, okay? And that actually penetrates the epidural space. That's good. And your needle would rest on one of the sacral vertebrae, so it's uh, stable, okay? So this is the, the approach if you want to have a continuous epidural anesthesia. The, the, the needle is connected to a line wherein it's constantly um, infusing local anesthesia to the epidural space, okay? So, yung mga matagal yung surgery, this could be done. Uh, for those na mabilis lang, <laughs> yung mabilis lang, uh, or one time mo lang siyang bibigyan ng uh, epidural anesthesia, the more of a 80 to 90 degree angle, kasi sinasabi nila, yes, it's 90 degrees, but you flip your needle a little bit towards you, just about 10 degrees, and that's the perfect angle. So parang 80 degrees yung um, perfect angle nila. Okay? That's, that's, that's one of their tips in, in, the video, in the videos. Right? So to make it easier if you're using a big needle and you think that the animal will react to it, then baka mapuncture mo yung meninges or the dura mater. Um, you can infiltrate the area first, the skin with 1 ml lidocaine to make the needle incision uh, easier. And one important thing, the bevel, the bevel of your needle, where the, the hole is. If you are giving the drug, uh, sorry, for a surgery that is done with a cranial abdomen or about craniocaudal abdomen, then you diffuse, the, the bevel should face cranially. Para yung drug mag diffuse cranially. But if you are doing surgeries of the perineum, the hind legs, the anus, the, the genital area, then you have to have the bevel facing you when you're uh, because you do this uh, when you are um, behind the animal, all right? You have the bevel should be facing you and it should be facing caudally so that the drug will actually go caudally to the needle, all right? I think that makes sense. And how do you know you're in? You will hear. Uh, sometimes you will hear. <laughs> sometimes you will just feel it. You will you will encounter a resistant tissue which is the interspinous ligament. Um, this is your ligamentum flavum. If you look for if you look for the different name for it, like um, once you penetrate it, the resistance would go away, and you know that you're in the um, epidural space. One way also to know this is that you can do the hanging drop technique, wherein 
um, once you enter the subcutaneous tissue and parts of the fluid, parts of the um, muscle, sorry, um, you place a drop of lidocaine on the needle hub and you insert the needle more until you reach that epidural space. Once you reach that epidural space, that amount of lidocaine inside the needle will be sucked down. And that's how you know that you're in the epidural space. And when you get to that point, you have to keep the needle in that direction, in that angle, until you inject the local anesthetic. All right. So um, again, how do we know that this would work? Um, aside from pinching and all that, you can see that the tail would go flaccid. Para siyang naka, naka, um, the, the normal behavior of the cattle is that it will normally swish the tail from side to side, but then the tail would become flaccid. Uh, when you pinch the skin around the vulva, there is no reaction. So that's um, uh, those are ways to identify that your anesthetic is working. Right? This is a video of it. Can you fill that space? Yep. So you kind of want to go midline and perpendicular to her, and then have your little bevel on your guy facing you. Yep. Yep. Bone, and cradle, and coddle, and you can kind of try to slip in between. So try to hold that steady. Yep. Keep your hand on that. This is the hanging drop technique. Three to five minutes, then you're good to go. All right. Move now to the anesthesia of the foot. All right. Still very commonly, uh, commonly done um, for the bridement of foot abscesses, digital amputation, removal of corn, um, not the food, the interdigital fibromas, which is called corn, uh, laceration repairs, which is common, uh, common for small ruminants, uh, basically all of them. I think the only a surgery that I saw in horses that is talagang surgery talaga is a laceration on its leg. Yep. And how did they do this? Yeah. Um, no, they they did they did epidural for this. Yeah, for that. But for those distal areas of the foot where and you don't need to um, do much, what you could do is a beer block. Um, you place a tourniquet proximal to the plan. Mm, sorry, incision site and inject lidocaine into the distal limb veins. All right, and you have a lot of options. A, you have the dorsal metacarpal metatarsal vein, which is on the uh, cranial aspect of the limb. You have the palmar plantar digital vein, which is on the caudal aspect of the limb. You have the dorsal digital vein, which is much lower than the, which is the uh, distal extension of the metacarpal vein. Um, and of course, the lateral saphic vein, which is on the lateral aspect of the limb, the pelvic limb, right? So how much do you inject this? This is dependent on the site and duration of surgery. Usually the, the, the maximum is 30 mil of 2% lidocaine. And once done, um, the tourniquet must be released slowly to prevent signs of lidocaine toxicity. Because uh, remember, the lidocaine is in the veins. 
and the tourniquet is preventing that lidocaine from spreading across the body. So you cannot just remove the tourniquet ng mabilis lang. You have to gradually release it uh, to prevent the lidocaine into the systemic circulation ng mabilis. Right? The limit for your tourniquet, you know, for it to be there without loosening it is around 90 minutes. Right? So you should do your surgery that fast. And since it's just a you know, foot surgery, it usually doesn't last longer than that. Right? Next to the anesthesia of the other and the teeth, uh, the common way to do this is a ring block. Right? You, do a, uh, you put an elastic band or tourniquet around the base of the teeth and you infiltrate um, that with 5 to 6 ml of lidocaine with a 25 gauge needle. All right, as you can see in the images here, um, that's A, yeah, A and B, right? A is just a different view of it. Now, the sister infusion is when you insert or directly infuse the lidocaine, usually 10 ml of it, um, into the teeth via teeth cannula for conditions affecting the mucous membrane, right? Usually polyp removal, web veins and such uh you i think you'll discuss that more in med right so a 30k still still needs to be placed um going to the letter c i'm focusing now on the picture c and um then you infuse it all right why do you need to put a tourniquet on it you're not putting it in a vein you're putting it into where the uh, milk passes through why do you need to place a tourniquet Hmm? Because you want to prevent the milk from diluting the local anesthetic, right? So what's next? Oh, you also can do IV regional teeth anesthesia. You place a tourniquet and the superficial vein is catheterized and that's where you place um, your local anesthetic. The anesthesia of uh, the other the teeth are quite um, complicated because uh, if, you, if you just wanted to like block certain nerves because the cranial aspect of the teeth has a different innervation as compared to the caudal aspect the cranial aspect is supplied by the fibers of the first and second lumbar spinal nerves while the caudal aspect is supplied by the fibers from the third and fourth uh, lumbar spinal nerves so it, it will be hard if you do like a nerve block or if you need to do paravertebral um, nerve blocks or epidural just for the anesthesia of these small anatomical structures way ventral to those nerves so what's best for them would be just uh, local anesthesia all right so that is it for module five almost two hours in totality for the two videos thank you so much for sticking it <laughs> with me for this uh, lesson what is our lesson for next week? I have no idea, but we'll find out. Um, expect, the, expect the problem sets for fluid therapy to include anesthetic drugs as well. That's why I haven't posted it yet. It's not because I haven't done it. It's because I wanted to include anesthesia. Um, so wait for it within the week. I promise I will post it within the week. All right. It's getting better. My time management is getting better. Right. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I will post the questions in the Google Classroom. I would expect your answers through the Google Classroom or through um, we call this uh, through personal messaging through email or messenger. All right, you know how to contact me. Thank you very much. Oh, also uh, one thing: when you answer first, that actually accounts for more points. The, notice that. Yes, you can repeat the answers that you already see there just for you to have student participation points. Uh, but um, it matters to me that you actually answer first. So try to, try to, try to. All right. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the week. Have a good day.